Thank you, stranger. I needed that. My name? My name's Brock. I'm the man who reports everything without fear or favor. And I'm getting old, man. I'm getting old. You know, all those trips between Altoona and Philadelphia, over to Albany, down to New York City, down to Baltimore, and then back home in one day. But you know, the game has changed. It's not like it used to be. I used to sit in the upper deck, 20,000 people screaming for the Midnight Express to be beaten by the rock and rolls. Ain't like that these days. Today I cover the indie scene, you know what I'm saying? It's a whole different ball game these days. I'm looking for the next star. You know, I was the undercover guy that kind of went to the promoters and said, I got a star for you. They'd pay me off on another drink and another pack of smokes, but... It was all worth it. Mm-mm. Boy, I needed that. Anyway, I just came back from disgusting, bloodletting wrestling, a young independent group out of Pennsylvania, and well, it was quite the show. You know, it started off with a scientific match. Well, there was only two chainsaws in the ring for that one. And then the second match was uh, a ladder match. Of course, the ladder was outside the building, but, you know, the main event was simply a guillotine match. You know, the guillotine hold? No, this this was an actual guillotine. Anyway, that's independent wrestling these days, you know? Bring the kids. I don't know what to say sometimes. I miss the days of the American dream. I miss the days of the four horsemen. I miss the days of Bruno Sammartino. Pedro Morales. Whole scores of people will show up to root for those fine men. Now it seems like the fans are rooting for somebody to get hurt. I don't like that, because I'm hurting. No woman in my life anymore. She left me when I've when she found out I had a poster of Tina Ferrari. Oh, what can a lonely man do on the road? You know what I'm saying? In any event, it's been a good life, a long life in wrestling. But I think I'm reaching the end of the road. My tires are getting bald, if you know what I mean. The old DeVille doesn't run like it used to, and it costs more and more to keep it up. Sure, I don't mind eating frozen sandwiches. I just tape them to my manifold in my car, and they're nice and hot. But it's getting old, you know what I'm saying, and so am I. I need to lay me down and take it a little easier than I used to. So before I retire, though, I just want to see one more great match. Where is my great match? I'm waiting for another classic that we'll talk about 30, 40 years ago. Like Buddy Rogers versus Pat O'Connor or Bruno versus Pedro. Where are all those great matches? I don't know. Hey, I'm sorry to chew your ear off, man. I'm uh, about ready to mosey down the road again. Hey, it's no problem. I kind of enjoyed listening to you talk. Oh, what about you? What's your story, stranger? Why'd you give me $20 out of nowhere? I knew who you were. I read your stuff for years. You're one of my all-time favorites. Wait a minute. You're the guy in that podcast. Yes, I am. I'm getting out of here. Ah. It's the outdated wrestling hour. We are so glad to have you back. Welcome back to the Outdated Wrestling Hour. My name's Bob Smith, the former pro wrestling illustrated office grunt. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, managing editor. <laughs> Just having a little fun. I'm being a little cerbic today. It's been a funky time the last couple of weeks here. Uh, I think I mentioned in my last podcast that um, there were some technical snafus with uh, 
stats compiling and stuff like that, which left me a little bit world weary. For about 10 days, I felt really lousy about it, but there's nothing you can do. Things fail, things break. I'm going to assuage my uh, little bit of the blues with a great guest here, Mr. George Shire, one of the great wrestling historians of our time. There's no question about that. So we're going to look back at uh, Minnesota wrestling and the AWA and a whole lot of other things with George. And uh, I hope you're going to get a big kick out of this because he's great on other podcasts. I've heard him on other shows and he's just fabulous. So, hey, enough of my yakking. Let's let's go to Minnesota. Or should I say, let's go to Minnesota, you know? And let's let's welcome one of the greats, Mr. George Shire. Okay, I am very excited because we have a guest here who has been in the wrestling business for a long, long time. And he probably, to this day, does more before lunch than I do in a month. <laughs> He's one of those guys with, with with the tremendous energy and tremendous talent. Um, he wrote a book that was published in 2010 called Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling from Vern Gagne to the Road Warriors. And it is a classic. If you do not own it, you must own it. If you want to complete your wrestling history, this is one of the books you really need to have in your library. A Minnesota native, he's also the author of an outstanding AWA record book series, which you can also pick up. All of it's in print. And he's also the host of some popular in-person talks on Minnesota wrestling history in his home state. I've read about those, and they're well attended and well worth checking out if you're in the area. He's got a fantastic Facebook group called George Shire's Wrestling Time Machine. He's a podcast and an in-demand podcast guest, so I demanded to get him here. <laughs> and he's also a board member of the newly revived WFIA, um, the Wrestling Fans International Association. And he's I probably left out about 75% of the other things he does. He is a, I don't know, a historian and a wrestling legend, Mr. George Shire. How, I'm so proud to have you here. I really am. Well, Bob Smith, I'm going to have to put a check in the mail to you after that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's very. Is that kind. okay? Did I cover it all right? Or I think you did. You know, I sit back and I think it's fun when I just reflect on the fun things, going to the old matches, and I've been able to be a ring announcer, and I did TV up in Winnipeg for one mm-hmm. some independent group. You know, being the host of the show, and and I was a, a heel wrestling manager in the in the early two thousands, and uh, I don't. I, that was a blast, by the way. So, I'm sure yeah, it was. It's just fun. But I love my, my key thing in life is that I love to research. I love learning and continuing to uh, know the history of old school pro wrestling. And back when I tell fans, and I always do it with uh, quotations, when it was real, as real as they wanted it to be. Doggone right. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Now, early when I started this podcast, I started this podcast in January. After being away for like 30 years, I did a podcast with John Rizzi for a year. Then I segued into my own thing here. Good guy, by the way. And um, one of the early guests I had was Joyce Postian, who you may know. I know her. I really really enjoyed her photo book. I actually said, sell me your book. I didn't want her to give me one. I said, sell me a book. And you know what? That's the closest thing to the vibe I used to get buying wrestling magazines. It reminded so many photos, so many memories. It was just fantastic. But that reminded me of your book. Uh, Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling. It's got to be one of the most painstakingly researched wrestling books I've ever read. I mean, it, it came out in 2010. It's still in print, gang. And uh, where does that book land personally with you amongst your accomplishments? Um, it's, I got to admit, it's a high note. I, mm-hmm. You know, it's funny, Bob, because it came around in, in a, a weird kind of way, uh, 2010, as you say, and it was about a good 10, 11, 12, 13 years before that, all of these wrestling or wrestler books started coming out, published. You know, it became a big thing. I mean, back when I was a fan, there was no such thing as a wrestling book uh, on the newsstands or, or in the in the bookstores or anything. And what, what my problem was is that some of the books that were coming out, I would look at them and they would have uh, pictures mislabeled with wrong names, or they'd have the wrong information for particular wrestlers, or they, you know, it was all kinds of, and I'd pick them apart. And true story, I was sitting in my kitchen one day and I got a book. And to me, it was the worst book I'd ever picked up in my life. I just was, I was so livid with it. And I didn't know the person that did it. But I said, how did this happen? 
And my younger daughter at the time, she was, I think she was about, uh, what, 2010? She'd have been 20 years old. She said to me, she goes, Dad, instead of complaining about it, why don't you do your own book? Well, that was kind of the seed, even though I'd kind of thought about it, you know. But that's where it comes from. You know, rather than complain, try to do it yourself. And let me tell you this, saying all of that, we always make mistakes. There, In any book I've ever picked up, including my Minnesota book, I could point to a couple of things in there that got put in wrong. But I'm I'm just a stickler about it being right. And uh, if you're not going to do it right, don't do it at all. So that's how it started. And it is a big thing. It was fun to get it out. It's even more fun, Bob, because like you say, here we are, 2023. And I can still go to our local Barnes and Noble bookstores here in the state of Minnesota where I live. And anytime I visit any Barnes and Noble, I always just mosey over to the sports section and I look and doggone it, there's one or two or three of my books sitting there. Isn't and what I will do, I, and I, I know they sell them because what I will do is I always ask the uh, manager, I say, you know, you want me to sign the book for you? Oh yeah, we love that autograph sticker on there. So I put them on there and next time I come in there, they're three, two or three new books. So I don't know, it's had a life. That's it really good. has. As someone who has contributed to a couple of sports books myself, what you've done is almost impossible because sports books go out of print. It doesn't matter what sport it is. Sports books have a tendency to have a year or two shelf life and go right into the remainder bin after that, no matter how popular they were, because sports is transient. You know, new stars oh, yeah. come yeah. about and things like that. Yeah. The fact that your book is still around after all these years, I think, is testament to well, how good it is, to be honest with you. Let me tell you this, and my wife reminds me of this. Um, the first year the book came out, I will give a lot of kudos to the Minnesota Historical Society Press. It's the Minnesota History Center. Mm -hmm. They did a tremendous drop on this book. I will tell you, I appeared on all local TV stations here. I live in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'm in a suburb of, of St. Paul, Oakdale, Minnesota. But I was on every TV station on all the morning talk shows. They would set me up. Can you go here? Can you go there? I swear I was on every radio station in the Twin Cities and other places. They would set it up for me. They know so and so we want to go you want to go on there. So for that first year, and then book signings, you know, go to Barnes and Noble or Borders bookstores we had back then. Um, go to a bookstore. Can you will you do a signing? And and the idea was, yeah, sure, you know, hey. And so that first year, year or two, that worked that way. But since then, it's been me. I've kept it alive. I remind people. And I'm on the board and I associate with all these people. You know, anybody that's an old wrestling fan, let's talk wrestling. I love it. That's why you and I reached out to each other, you know. Mm -hmm. and, right. uh, and and I'm surprised we didn't touch base before. Although, you know, because I used to buy the, uh, I have all of the pro wrestling illustrateds and uh, wrestlers and inside wrestlings. and. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny when I left that company, I ran out of there because I was, I was, uh, how do I put it? I wasn't mad at the company. I was just mad at the circumstances. You know, I, I just, I, I got the first job I could get and got out of there real fast because it was a situation where I had to keep a roof over my head. That, that was the thing. Totally and, and you know, when you wrote for a wrestling magazine, it was in 1992, 93, there's no internet, there's no cell phones. Right. You had to have, you know, papers in front of you for your stuff, books, magazines. You had to do everything through brain power and saving things that were in print. There was no, there was no, if you folks can imagine, you younger listeners out there, if you can imagine, you know, you, you can't look at something up on Wikipedia in 1993. There was no such, no such animal. So well, I, I had to go, you know, I had to go, go do something else. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I remind people, and that's that's really when you said there's no internet or anything. You know, I I think today we don't know how lucky we have it when you say just Google something. Oh, yeah. Well, you still have to hope it's right. Mm -hmm. But I tell people, I say, you know what? When when I From the time I was about 14 years old, man, I would hit the libraries. I'd look at newspapers, go to microfiche sit there and look through newspapers and I tease and I say in towns, I didn't even know that were towns, but I'd look for wrestling to get results or get, you know, clippings. And that was all hard work, man. Mm -hmm. You know, spending a night after school or spending all day Saturday at the public library. And I used to do that in my teen years. And then later on, it's the same thing. It's, it's 
tediously looking up the research. Whereas today it's so easy. It's just, oh, there it is. Now, the other side of it, as I said a moment ago, is it factual? Because a lot of times today, because you mentioned Wikipedia, oh right. my gosh, my heart just pumps every time I hear that word because I have people say, well, it's right here on Wikipedia and they'll show me the, well, it's wrong. Whoever mm-hmm. put it in there, it's wrong. Oh yeah, they have they have Bill Apter writing the first two PWI 500s. Uh-uh, I did. Yeah. But I'm not going to change it. It's not that big a deal. But the fact of the matter was, I was the one, I didn't come up with the concept, but I did write the first two in 1991, 1992. And it says Bill did it. Fine. I don't care. Well, and it's <laughs> even worse. It's even worse, Bob, because, you know, Wikipedia, and I don't know if they still let you do this, but any Joe Schmo can go can in. Dump and into it, yeah. And then, yeah. and I used to do that, uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I'd go in and I'd correct a paragraph or correct a bio for somebody. And I'd come back, you know, two weeks later and lo and behold, uh, no, no, it's this way here. And okay, fine. You know, you can't argue with um, if they believe what they're going to believe, you just leave it that way. Right. <clears throat> you know, I want to touch on your book just one more time because it's so it's so good, man. <laughs> it's well, like you're kind. You're, you're kind. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, if, if there's in this book, if there's an AWA star or a Minnesota wrestling star, he or she's included. You, you really nailed the rosters and, and you're looking back historically year by year and everything else. But my favorite part of the book are those amazing sidebars. Peppering the, peppering the book all throughout, little nuggets of historical facts and figures that really you can't get anywhere else, even to this day. Yeah, and it's interesting about those because that was my idea when we were doing the book. Because you got to remember in 2010, we were still doing the book somewhat, I want to use the word kayfabe in, in many ways. But it was it was just a way to put in something like this is what happened behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned a moment ago about my I have three AWA wrestling record books that are out. Mm-hmm. Now, I did those books with uh, a fellow wrestling historian, Mark James. Mark is in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. He's done a great bunch of books himself on, on history of Tennessee wrestling in Memphis and whatever. Well, he and I decided we were going to publish these AWA books. He would publish them for me. But every single thing from cover to cover in that book or in those books is mine. Mark didn't do any of the research, nothing. I I always like to clarify that because his name is on the cover. Mm -hmm. You know, it's George Shire and Mark James on the cover. But um, they are 100% my contribution. But here's what I did with those. To me, it was important, too, because when you're talking results, it's kind of funny, Bob, because people say, well, why do you why do you want to talk about results when you're talking about a prearranged sport? And, you know, does it make a difference? Results are so much fun Mm -hmm. because of the very nature of the way the wrestlers worked in the territory days when we had 25 or 30 territories around the country. And, you know, the wrestler could start here as a baby face. And then they go somewhere else and they're using a different name. And then they're a heel or they're under a mask or they're feuding with their former partner in a different territory. And you you see the wrestler grow. You see how in one territory they were pushed, another territory they may be a mid-carder. And that's the way their careers went Mm -hmm. as they traveled around the circuit. You know, and like I say, 25 territories just in the United States. And they did travel in those days. You know, a wrestler would come into a territory and maybe be there, a, a, you know, a year, two years most, and then they'd move on to mm-hmm. a new territory, start a new gimmick, or or just, you know, get a fresh start. That's what and kept so, the that's what kept the federations fresh too. To be honest, a new right. face. <laughs> you know, everybody gets stale after a while, and people willingly, the wrestlers willingly went from territory to territory. Exactly right. I mean, people like Andre the Giant and Ernie Land were always special attractions because they didn't stick stick around too long. Well, and, you know, the special attractions like Andre, which he definitely became probably the premier attraction, Mm -hmm. uh, going into a territory for a a six, eight week period and just going around the horn in big matches, um, drew money. But then he moved on to the next territory because of his exclusivity. I can't even say the word, Marty (laughs) O'Neill. But he was exclusive. And but, you know, the territory system. And I think when I look back, to what happened, and it's coming up, doggone it, next month, it's going to be 40 years 
in December of 83, when Vince McMahon fired that first bullet, taking Hulk Hogan from the AWA. And in his attempt to go national, I mean, that's when it started, Bob. And, you know, we didn't understand it at the time that this was what was going to happen. Pay-per-view was new, a kind of a new concept. Uh, but what happened after that with, with Vince McMahon raiding all the territories and taking all the talent and, and changing the business as he did, um, I, I didn't handle it well back then, but I, I totally get it now. You know, it was going to happen, and it is what it is. We moved on. Um, let's talk about the AWA a little bit. Um, you were there for the glory period. I mean, the Vern Gagne's, Nick Bockwinkel's, Ray Stevens, you know, uh, Pat Patterson, you name it. All the great stars from the 70s and 80s into the 90s. Um, forget about the books. How much did you enjoy that that organization? I absolutely enjoyed it. Number one, you have to remember that um, as a kid, I was a kid um, in the 60s, teenager. And once I got my driver's license, I, I got more freedom because I could go to a lot of the small town cards that would appear in Minneapolis and St. Paul. But Minneapolis and St. Paul, the Twin Cities, they would have weekly, biweekly or uh, monthly cards on a regular basis in one or both of the auditoriums in the two cities. And then, of course, the spot shows and going around to the smaller towns and visiting them. That was so much fun. And, you know, you mentioned some names, you rattled them off. But if I back up, Bob, to the 60s, mm -hmm. oh, my God, when when Vern Gagne took over the reins in 1960, you know, he had been here for the 50s when when Minneapolis was under the NWA umbrella. Mm -hmm. We were in NWA territory. And if you go back to the 50s, I mean, I, I went back and I've collected all the programs from the 50s. And, you know, the names that came through Minneapolis, we say Minneapolis because that was the headquarters, okay? So when you say Minneapolis, we're talking the entire territory that they promoted in. Right. And, and you, you look at the names just in the 50s, but in the 60s, you know, we always had Vern as a mainstay because he was the owner. We didn't know that when we were younger, that he was the owner behind the scenes and he was the champ on and off. But we had the mainstays like every territory does. The mainstays in those days in the 60s being Vern, the Crusher, Mad Dog Vashon was pretty much a regular here, and Larry Henning. Uh, they, they were the guys that any other talent that came in or out, they would eventually end up in a program against one of those four or five guys. They were built around them. And if you go to any territory, you've had you got the same type of situation. You've got their versions of the Ganyas and the Crushers and the Mad mm -hmm. etc. So the wrestlers would come in. And when, when we look at the talent roster in the 60s, aside from the guys I just mentioned, you know, we had Dick the Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder and the Alaskan and and uh, Dr. X was here. It was Dick Byer who was the destroyer everywhere else, but he was Dr. X here for Vern Gagne. And we had Cowboy Bill Watts and the Andersons and Von Raschke. And and uh, I mean, oh my gosh, I, I, you make a list, you, you, you run out of paper. Right. And it continued into the 70s when you had the Robinsons and Jeff Ports and Horst Hoffmans and Superstar Grahams on the roads and Murdoch. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, the names just Ivan Koloff. Um, no matter how long, like I say, no longer how, how much we talk, we, we leave a name or 10 off. Right. And so it was a very vibrant territory. And one of the things that I have heard from Every single wrestler of those decades that I've ever talked with, they will always say two things. One, they wanted to come to the AWA because it had a lesser travel schedule, an easier travel schedule. And number two, it was a good pay territory. Everybody will tell you that Vern Gagne in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, he paid well. And they could have a lesser schedule. Um, the AWA, we didn't run a lot of cards in the summer times, usually from about the uh, the second week of June through maybe the third week in August. We had no wrestling matches. If we did, it was only one card. But they didn't wrestle in the summer because people didn't go to the wrestling matches. In Minnesota, we only have, you know, three months of nice weather. And people were out on their boats and fishing and camping and going on vacations. So 
the promoters were smart and realized that the best time to promote wrestling is through those winter months. And I swear to you, it can be 10 below zero. We can have snow falling all day and have a foot of snow, and it'll be a wrestling card that night, and they will have 8,000 people there. This is back in the auditorium days. And, I mean, it just, that's the way it was. It was a rabid, a rabid uh, territory. One of the things about modern fans is if they didn't see it on videotape, it didn't happen. I insist, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the AWA was every bit as successful as every other wrestling organization during its prime. Oh, my gosh. You know, again, you go back to the wrestlers themselves when you say, well, everybody aspired to come to the AWA. And like you say, on any roster at any given time, aside from your four or five mainstays, you can only have maybe 10 or 15 other wrestlers at any given time on, shall we say, the payroll, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. I mean, you can't have 40, 50 wrestlers. So, yeah, it was it was tough. And that's where that that revolving door came in where when you when your your shtick got tired and you were wearing out a little bit with your gimmick or whatever or maybe you weren't drawing the same fans you moved to a new territory but the AWA when when you look at the talent that came through um i can tell you that of the when you looked at the old wrestling magazines in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and you looked at the they put in their official world ratings you know and mm-hmm. uh, whatever um, you looked at all the wrestlers, they, they'd all been in or are or going to come to the AWA. That's the way it was. Mm-hmm. So, you know, back in the 60s, all we heard about in the magazines in AWA land, all we heard about was Ray Stevens in the magazines from, from California. You know, he was their, he was their guy, in, you know, selling out the Cow Palace for a decade. And when he finally came here in 1971, that was after the Shire promotion out there had fallen on hard times and <clears throat> wasn't doing as well. And Ray was here, Vern had him. And of course he, it was like, we got Ray Stevens, you know, it was so mm-hmm. cool. And one of the things that I always thought was fun, and I've told this to people, I said, you know, I must've been a freak because when I'd go to wrestling matches back in the day, I used to, we used to get the little four page programs, you know, Mm -hmm. specific to the card you were at. It told, they were made up stories, but they talked about the feud you were going to see tonight and whatever. And I would buy, I buy a program for my collection, but I'd also buy 10 or 15 extras. And I started sending them to people, St. Louis, Tampa, Dallas. I ended up with all these correspondents all over where I could get their program every week. And, you know, I started building this collection. So I always knew where everybody was. I knew when one of my favorites was when uh, our our ring and now our TV announcer, Marty O'Neill, who was a class act in his own right. Mm-hmm. He said he come out on TV and he says, well, fans, we're sorry to report Pepper Gomez has been injured, as you know, and it, we're, we don't know when he's going to be back. And I giggle because I just received a program from San Francisco, and guess who's in their main event? Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to break the tape <laughs> to me. I mean, and, and, but other fans would not have known that, Bob. Right. And, of course, I never said anything. I never – boy, I'll tell you what. When you were a wrestling fan when you were a teenager back in the day, you'd have the kids, you know, you know that stuff's fake, don't you, Shire? Uh, we're not going there. I, I don't – then we don't talk about it because you're not going to understand. And. Uh, you know, was it fake? I have a I have a thing in my book that you, if you looked at the introduction, I have a thing in there, a little paragraph. Was it real? Was it fake? Or was it something else? And then we talk about that something else. And it that, was. That something. is, you know something? That's the best way to put it. And that's the way I put it in my book. I'm telling you, that that's it. You just explain the appeal of professional. Is it real? Right. Is it fake? Or is it something else? Right. And, and you and that, know it was something else. Yeah. And that's what I wanted people to understand because I wrote that in there because I specifically, I remember the question people would say, well, you know, that stuff's fake. Or, you know, they'd even ask the wrestlers, well, that stuff's fake, isn't it? You know, the wrestlers hated that fake word. God bless them. They they work their heart, their hearts out in the ring to entertain us, put their bodies through hell. Yeah, they the, yeah, the matches, they protected each other and the endings were predetermined. But it was a soap opera, kids. It was something that you enjoyed, you could follow. And when you left the arena, 
if they had you believing that Billy Robinson really did beat Nick Bockwinkel but got gypped out of it because the referee got knocked down, you're going to have a rematch and you're going to come back to it. That's what it's all about, making mm-hmm. you want to come back. Because Billy won, but he didn't get the title. Oh, my gosh. And and if if you don't understand that, I used to tell this to people. I said, if you don't understand that concept, then you don't get it and you can't get it. And with that comment I made about is it real, is it fake, or is it something else, I remembered the comment that wrestler Nick Kozak made. And he said it many times. He said, when someone says to him, wrestling isn't real or it's fake, he said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing now, he says, for those who believe, no no explanation is necessary. For those who don't believe, no explanation will do. And I put that in my book with my quote, and then I added another one myself. I said, pro wrestling is a lot like Santa Claus. It's more fun when you believe. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) To me, that's beautiful. Because when you look at Christmas and, and you look at Santa Claus, well, as adults, we're there and we're putting this this fantasy and this this thing to the children and you'd watch little kids eyes and Santa Claus and Christmas and all of the hoopla and they believed and that's what made it special so if you go to the matches and you can just suspend that disbelief for a nanosecond it's beautiful enjoy it for what it was the greatest soap opera on the planet earth Mm -hmm. that's for sure and you know what was, we'll move ahead a little bit now in, in time, just because I want to, it was like an answer prayer to me when the AWA got a TV contract with the ESPN in the 80s. I went, oh boy. I never had an opportunity to see it, right? This is long before I was with PWI. I joined them in 88. So I started to watch that show. And I, I to be honest with you, it was my favorite show on television. I fell for it instantly because it was the meat and potato style that I grew up watching, yeah. even here on the East Coast. It wasn't as colorful, but I didn't want it to be as colorful. It was grittier. It was it was more sports oriented, shall we say? And I really loved the show. But all good things must come to an end. And after a few years, you could see the cracks in the foundation. And like you say, the the, the talent raids, the the major stars started to disappear. And even though they had put out some really good shows and laid on, they had some amazing stuff with Kurt Heading and Nick Bockwinkle and oh, yeah. Larry Zabisco and some other great stars. But you could see it eroding to the point where the last probably six months was, they shouldn't have even done it. You know, it was, it was they were out of talent. They were doing matches in empty TV studios. It was sad. Well, I, and felt, you know, I, felt, I felt very bad when the AWA went out of business. Well, and imagine me that this is my home territory because I'd had the opportunity to do a lot of traveling back in the day and being to a lot of other territories. And of course, my hometown was always the best. But watching that last, I want to say the last two years, two and a half years, Mm -hmm. um, I've compared it to watching a loved one slowly pass away and not being able to do anything to help it and just having to watch it die. and. It doesn't mean that they didn't try. It doesn't mean, you know, when you look at the empty TV studios and things, a lot of people don't realize all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Right. It wasn't just that Vern Gagne, you know, it wasn't that Vern Gagne didn't have, couldn't get talent anymore. It was that the the whole, there was no longer a handshake. You work for me and you're going to work here six months or a year. This is what you're going to be paid. And you go on like that. It wasn't like that anymore. And it was a lot of backstabbing. It was guys not not showing up because um, the out east promoter started dragging them out and paying them more, or offering them more. And you know, even going into the TV stations, we know from the old days that the lifeblood of any wrestling promotion, if you don't have a TV outlet to promote and sell your product, you're not going. You can't. You can't run cards on a regular right. basis. So mm-hmm. TV was the lifeblood. And when you have uh, uh, the the WWF at the time when they're going into a city and saying, "I'm gonna the TV station said I'm gonna pay you to not run Vern Gagne's show," you know, and the TV station doesn't care; they're getting paid. They just want that's, money. That's they're, exactly they're right. Business. That's another entity, and so. All of a sudden, Vern can't get his TV slot. He can't get his TV time. Um, even with the auditoriums, the arenas, 
wrestling was just like anything else, any other uh, entertainment venue, you know, the ice capades or the, the circus or or whatever these things are that uh, arenas rent out to on a regular basis, concerts, they're booked out for a year, two years in advance. And so the wrestling promoter, Vern Gagne, just use him because we're talking AWA, he would have the, the St. Paul Civic Center or the Minneapolis Auditorium, he would have the dates all booked out for a year in advance or, or longer. And on this date, you're going to have a card there. Well, when you finally get, again, that don't rent to Vern, rent to me, and I will pay you to not run his. This is what was going on, and people don't remember or don't know it. Mm-hmm. And eventually, how do you run your how do you run your card? So before you know it, the great, almighty, beautiful AWA faded into the sunset, a, a sad demise. Mm-hmm. And um, the glory days, though, wow! You know, ESPN was about the end of it. I mean, that was it was still professionally done. Mm-hmm. Although I tell people, you know, when you look at the old studio wrestling matches, we'll just use the 60s and the 70s. Right, right. You were in a TV studio with a, a set of bleachers around the ring and you'd bring in 100 fans to, you know, hoot and holler for the TV matches. The, the main ingredient for those was that the wrestler had to get themselves over on the interview for the for the upcoming card. And they only had two or three minutes to get out there and sell themselves to the to the guy sitting on his couch at home, drinking his beer, having his popcorn, to get out there and buy a ticket. And if he was a bad guy, he had to make you hate him and want to see him get beat. And if he was the good guy, you had to make, I want to go see this guy because he's going to clean that other one's clock. Mm-hmm. You know, there you go. And that was the beauty of the business. Well, it changed. Because then the the studio matches were now big auditoriums and you had, you know, the way it is today. Totally different product. I will say this. To this day, it amazes me just from a commerce concept that you could do a wrestling show in a small TV arena in front of 100 to 200 people. And that would translate to a full arena a week later. Yeah. You know? And in our case... A lot of our Saturday, we used to have wrestling here in the Twin Cities at six o'clock on Saturday nights, mm-hmm. and it would run six to seven thirty live. And then, if we had a, a a live card that night, we'd have the card would start at nine o'clock, which by today's standards is a late starting time. Mm. But you'd get the program run. They do something to that last minute grab you. You know, something they do on TV to make you want to get to the auditorium. And they always had a strong walk up. And then our I mentioned Marty O'Neill. Marty would close the program, the all-star wrestling program at 730. He'd say, fans, run, don't walk to get your tickets. Well, <laughs> and again, like I said, in the wintertime, we could have snow coming down. It could be inclement weather and the people would get off their couch and they're going to go down there to see Nick Bockwinkle because this time he's got you know, so-and-so as an opponent, and he's going to lose. And they got to be there. So it worked. It was beautiful. Yeah, it really did work. It wor- And it worked in a lot of different, like you say, 25 territories, most of them very healthy at their primes. There was something about that mix. It, just, it was just magic. And it felt like it, as a young person, like you, you, you expressed earlier, going out there and seeing your first matches and seeing the wrestlers in real life and my God, they're so big and my goodness, they can jump so high and, you know, bound off the ropes and body slam. And I can't tell you how much I was thrilled that the first time I ever saw live professional wrestling. I do. I was a little kid. Um, It was August 6th of, um, in fact, I can turn my head over here and look at the poster. I have a poster from it. August 6th of 1957. And I was, I would have been six years old. Just a shy of my, or I would have been five almost, but six years old. And the main event was Ivan Kelmakov and Carol Kelmakov, the hated Russians, Mm -hmm. against, in a heel tag team match, against Mitsu Arakawa and Kenji Shibuya. And this is my fond, my first memory. I'm sitting in the arena. I look around, and I don't know how many fans were there. You know, there might have been three or 4,000. I don't know. But in my little mind, Bob, I looked around and I thought, oh, my gosh, the whole world is here. Because when you're five, six years old, your your neighborhood is the world. That's it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the kids you go to school with in first grade, that's it. Um, so all of these people and the booing that they, mm-hmm. the fans did when the Kelmakoffs were introduced, the hated Russians, and then the booing when the Japanese team came in. And I remind people that in, in the 50s, they, they weren't Japanese. They, they called them dirty Japs. You learned later on. And of course, today we know that's not politically correct, and it wasn't then either, but it was our world. So let's leave it at that. Mm-hmm. But you understand how the promoters played on the emotions of the fans. My dad was a World War II vet, and he hated the Japanese wrestlers, and he hated the Russians, you know, because we just come, you know, in 57, we were only eight years off of World War II coming to an end, and we'd had the Korean conflict and stuff in between there. So promoters were geniuses to have all the Germans and the Russians and the Japanese. And they were the bad guys, man. And they sold so much. And what's even funnier is when you learn later on that a lot of the guys that played these stereotypical characters, they weren't really Russian or Japanese or German any, in real life. Oh, yeah. You know, well, I just. The beauty of it. Well, I just did a, a trivia quiz on a recent episode with a couple of wrestling professional guys you yeah. know with a fandom so i sat them down two of them and i asked them i, I read off 15 names and i said which two are actually from where they're built from <laughs> right? yeah. because because and the two happened to be baron secluner who really was from the isle of malta and the iron sheik who really was from iran iran yeah but, but all the russians a lot of the japanese were not from there and but Everybody thought they were from there. And, well, and uh, again, you know, maybe that's part of the deal because we talked about whether people believe or don't believe. Mm-hmm. The fact that they bought into that that gimmick, they believed. Yes. There was a thing just the other day on Facebook. Somebody posted something about real Native American wrestlers. And they had posted Wahoo McDaniel and uh, they had some other pictures on there. I forget who they were. But somebody came in and said, well, you forgot Jay Strongbow. Well, I got news for you, folks. You know, you didn't forget him. He wasn't really an Indian. Right. He was an Italian. Mm -hmm. And I think he was from New Jersey originally. But Joe Scarpa, you know, he wrestled for a whole, he had a whole decade where he was a main event wrestler in the South and and a good career, held, held titles. And he was a draw. And all of a sudden, you know, in 1971, he shows up. In, in Vince Senior's territory as Chief J. Strongbow. Well, you know, we only, you know, the reason being was that Vince couldn't use another Italian up there at that time. <laughs> I mean, you had Bruno. That's right. Bra, and yeah. then you, you had Tony Parisi and you had uh, uh, Dominic Danucci. And, mm-hmm. you know, so let's bring in another Italian. Ta- no, it doesn't work that way. But I, I will remember- say, I will nope. say this about Strongbow. I, I was around in 72 when they, uh, my local TV affiliate switched from Pedro Martinez to the WWF in 72. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you something. Strongbow was over. Oh, yes. I mean, he yes. did his his role. And for people who didn't say early Chief J. Strongbow, not the 80s Chief J. Strongbow, but the 70s one, I was agree. could become a wild man when fouled. You know, he he had an amazing personality, soft spoken on in interviews until you got him angry, and then he went berserk. There was yeah. never a face like him before that I ever saw, and he was a huge star. People want to rewrite history. Oh, he's this fat old man. No, he wasn't. He was a major, major draw. Easily the number two face in the territory in the seventies. Well, and that goes back to the thing too when you say about whether where at what time period you saw a particular right. Person. You know, if if fans came on board in nineteen eighty five in the AWA, and they saw the crusher. I'm telling you, you saw an old man. You right. saw a man, and I I watched it, and I knew that he wasn't the dynamo that he'd been a decade or two decades earlier, but he was still able to draw based on his star power, mm-hmm. his charisma, but this wasn't the same crusher in the ring. He was a guy that couldn't, literally he couldn't do much. And he would tell his opponents, and the opponents would know, you know, you're not going to slam him anymore, and you're not going to do this or do that. But Crusher got over because of that that star power. And so when you say, well, at the end, Vern was using old guys like the Crusher and the Bruiser and Baron Von Raschke, yeah, they were old, but 
they still put butts in the seats because of that star power. Oh, yeah. And in, Indiana- in Indianapolis into the 90s, they were still using Moose Sherlock and, yeah. and uh, uh, <laughs> Dick the Bruiser, of course, who owned the territory. And they, they continued to draw. They needed those veterans to continue to attract fans. And for the most part, it actually worked until about 1990, really. Absolutely, it did. And then, you know, by 90, if we're being honest, that's when we'd have been about six years or five years into the uh, expansion era, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of those territories were on life support. Right. Uh, the, The wrestlers had thinned out because all the names were going to Vince. Even if he wasn't going to use them in a main event capacity or anything, he was using them just to go into a town that they'd once been popular in, in in the territory that Vince was promoting in. One thing I will point out to people, you know, people always say, well, uh, when Vince took over, he started raiding the AWA, and he he did raid us the most. He took Hulk, he took David Schultz, he took mm-hmm. Gene Okerlund, our announcer, mm-hmm. who was definitely a, a carnival barker excellent person in the business <laughs> at the time. He was. And he took uh, Jesse Ventura and he took Jim Brunzel and he ended up taking Mad Dog Vashon. Mm-hmm. And he took the Crusher eventually too. But you know what? He didn't use those guys. He didn't use Mad Dog or Crusher. The only thing he did was when he'd come into Milwaukee and promote a WWF card, he'd put the Crusher on the card just right. because that was going to draw Milwaukee fans. So he had a he had a, a reason for his madness, I guess, just to use him against Vern. But in the end, um, yeah, the old guard died down, died, was gone. They either retired or a lot of them started passing away, and the new guard took over. And now we look what we have today, and it's no longer pro wrestling. I guess it's entertainment. Well, let, let's do that. One of my favorite things I do on the show with most of the guests, we look at then versus now. Now, you, you mentioned earlier that you don't, to me, I think before we started recording, that you don't watch a whole lot of today's stuff. Is that true? Or uh, Yeah. You know, I, I'll turn it on now, right as we speak here now, in a, in a few minutes, uh, Monday Night Raw will come on. Right. Here in the Twin Cities. I'm, I'm an hour behind you. But uh, Monday Night Raw will come on. And there will be a Monday here and there where I'll turn it on. Mm-hmm. And I'll get to about 20 minutes, 25 minutes of it. And man, I got to turn it off. I can't take a 20 minute dissertation in the ring with just constant. What are you telling me? What are you trying to say? And that's what they do. That's at least that's what I see. Right. And then when I do watch it and to any other extent, I, I try to figure out, okay, now wait a minute. A month ago when I watched this, that guy was a bad guy. Now it looks like he's a good guy. I don't know what he's doing here. You can't figure it out. They switch them back. So many, you know, back in our area, if a guy made a, a heel to a, or a baby face to a heel turn, Wow. It was huge. It was. And it was worked so special where, man, the fans couldn't believe it. How could this guy turn bad or vice versa? You know, the, the, one of the greatest things that I ever remember was when Vern Gagne, and this kind of goes with here and now, when Vern Gagne, he was feuding with uh, Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson, who were the heels. And Vern and Billy Robinson had, had a bunch of matches around the horn with them. And supposedly they put Billy out of action. They, they were so rough, they put Billy out of action. And Vern was frustrated. And he says, you know, I can't, I can't wrestle against these guys and try to wrestle. I got to find somebody that can wrestle like they do. What am I going to, you know, I got to do something. And I got to avenge Billy. That was the storyline. Well, when he announced that he had contacted and talked Mad Dog Vashon into being his partner. I, I'll tell you what the fans, they were like, oh my God, Vern is nuts. He can't trust the dog. They had feuded. They had, they had one of the longest pro- ongoing programs from the 60s through up to 78. They hated each other. You know, storyline. Right. How can Vern trust the dog? Well, the dog part of the storyline goes was that Ray Stevens had put him out of action a little bit too. So he wanted to get revenge, but the fans are there, Bob. And this is why when you capture the fan, the the fans are there and they're saying, well, Vern's going to be in the ring against three enemies. You know, can he trust mad dog? Well, Vern and dog, not only win, 
but they stay together and win the tag team title. Right. Beautiful turn. Mm -hmm. And then to, to carry it a step farther that was even more genius. We go back to, we get to 1981, Vern retires. He's out of, out of the ring for two years. And Mad Dog is having problems with Jerry Blackwell and Sheik Adnan Al Casey. And they have, they have put him out of action and they have hurt him and he wants a partner. So he goes, and the story goes, he contacted Vern Gagne. And he says, Vern, you owe me a favor. This is, they're doing this over TV. You owe me a favor. Vern says, I'm retired. You owe me a favor. I want you to come out of retirement. You're going to help me get rid of the Sheik and, and Blackwell. And Vern, I'm not going to do it. And they dragged this on for a couple of weeks. Finally, Matt Vern comes out and he says, all right, all right. I've gotten phone calls from the dog. I've gotten telegrams. I've taken more verbal abuse from him than I would take from any, I wouldn't take from any other person. And he says, I, I think he's right. I owe him a favor. He, he came to my aid once. I will, I will team with him. Instant pop. Man, we had, we had crowds because the dog had talked Vern, number one, out of retirement, who Vern was not the Vern Gagne whirlwind we'd seen a decade or two earlier. Oh, yeah. He slowed down. He was now 55, 56 years old, but he was still Vern Gagne, and he drew. And so there was the magic of it. And the, the gimmick of the whole thing was when we beat the Sheik and Blackwell, they, they did this on TV. Dog says, Mad Dog says, you go your way, I'll go mine. No, it, it, that was mm -hmm. pro wrestling when it was promoted. But you see, what you just explained was the perfect, my four favorite words, the suspension of disbelief. Yep. Okay. Now, cut to today, where the door has been flung open. The secrets are known by even little kids. Yep. Fans who go to wrestling matches now, when you, in our day, I hate to sound like a older person, but in well, our we day. Are that's yeah, it. I know. What can I? It's the outdated wrestling hour. We're outdated, That's, right? We're outdated. <laughs> but here, here's the deal: when you and I were kids, we went to see our favorite good guy beat that awful bad guy for revenge, or just because the guy was so bad he deserved a good licking, right? Mm -hmm. Now fans sit down and they book the matches in their <laughs> heads, and they say this guy isn't being used right, or this guy is being you know overlooked. They're not concentrating on the action they're concentrating on what's going on backstage because the door has been flung open so wide right that it's a whole different fan mindset for when you and i were kids to today's kids and is that a good thing or a bad thing i don't know what to say about it other than this a lot of what the modern promoters have done, and including Vince McMahon and everyone else, has kind of perverted what wrestling was. We have seen simulated murders on on recent wrestling programs. Yeah. Not, not on the WWE, but... Well, no, they, they burned Bray Wyatt, supposedly burned Bray Wyatt alive on a pay-per-view right, around the right. pandemic. There was a couple of simulated murders on Impact Wrestling. There is foul language. There's people flipping the bird in the middle of the ring. There's they've really gone a little bit wild. And what bothers me is my era, your era, which precedes mine a little bit, the, the important history. I mean, you, you got a historical society to publish your book. 20 years from now, will a historical society even get near professional wrestling? I don't think so. Well, and uh, that probably is a, a good point. Um, but then 20 years from now, and of course, I, I don't know. Will you and I be around? We can't guarantee that. Right. We never could guarantee being around 20 years, but mm. you know, 20 more years. I don't know. I don't know, Bob, you know, I, I I've had people say to me, could wrestling go back and, and, and again, be a territorial thing. And I've, I've oftentimes said, no, I don't think so. Unless it went completely away for a decade, just, there was no wrestling at all. That's a good point. I like and that point. Maybe, then maybe it would be something new, how they presented it to a whole new generation. This is, un, this is unrelated to wrestling, but I had a conversation just the other day. When I grew up watching television in the 50s, I used to like the adventures of Superman. <laughs> George Reeves, by all standards, a cheesy program for the day. 
But in hindsight, if you watch it today, you know, hey, that was the Superman of our era. Mm-hmm. But there was a, there was a debate going on with somebody said, well, George Reeves was a better Superman than Kirk Allen was uh, in the movie serials in the late 40s. Kirk Allen played Superman. And then it got into the fact, well, wait a minute, you guys, Christopher Reeve was the best Superman. And I intervened in the conversation. I said, what you guys are failing to understand is that each of you, we have our own generation. My generation as a kid was George Reeves. When I grew up a little bit, Christopher Reeve, yeah, I saw the movies, but that was my daughter's generation. They didn't know George Reeves or Kirk Allen. So what you got to do is you got to realize that your generation was the best generation. Any WWE, AEW, Ring of Honor, whatever promotions are out there today, those fans will tell you that their wrestling, their entertainment is the best it's ever been. They're not wrong right? because right. it is for them. They, they don't understand our Yes, problem. and I can't criticize them for enjoying it. I, I won't do that because the, it's the passage of time. It's the changing of styles. It's mores change, styles change. I don't know what else to say other than, you know, how can I lambast a 17-year-old kid for buying wrestling tickets? Well, for, something, you know, for for an indie federation called, and if you've ever, if you're watching some of the indies now, they have names like, Holy terror wrestling and stuff like that. And, and, and there's hardcore and what they call deathmatch wrestling, which I abhor. I, I think that is the worst thing that's ever happened. ECW was not awful. I was involved with ECW in its formation, but I think that the legacy has been picked up by people who don't even understand the first thing about professional wrestling. And it's all shock, shock, shock. And I don't think. Well, it's a but then thing. You, you, just, you just made the million dollar point because. The people that don't know anything about wrestling are all the people in the WWF that aren't wrestling fans. They're people that were brought in to write and, and do right. skills. Yeah, you TV know, writers, yeah. When, when, when uh, <coughs> excuse me, when we talk about the interviews of the old school era, and I mentioned earlier, you got the guy coming out there, he's got two minutes to sell himself for the, for the, the upcoming card. Um, he did that off the cuff. That wrestler didn't have a script. He knew his opponent. He knew his city he was going to be in. And he rattled it off and he did it ad lib. Mm-hmm. Today, like I mentioned a minute ago, if I turn on Raw, th- the guys are out there for 20 minutes and they've had to memorize a, a 15 page script mm-hmm. to do the show tonight. Mm-hmm. It's all handwritten for them. So it, it has changed. It's different. One of the things that I always thought was interesting was I give Vince McMahon and all of the promoters of the modern era, I give them an A for marketing because you name it, it's got wrestling on it, they sell it. All of the marketing things that the kids and the, and the fans can have today. Whereas when I was growing up, if we were lucky, we were lucky to get a, a glossy eight by 10 photo of a, of a wrestler. The promotions didn't understand the value of it. They had photos available and and merchandise available for the wrestlers on their card. They could make additional money. The old school wrestlers did or promotions didn't do that. You've had a heck of a career, man. Uh, the things you've accomplished, the people you've met, <clears throat> the miles you've traveled. Um, I can't think of anything you haven't done. If you look back at your career, which is still going strong. Is there a moment or is there something that you've accomplished that you can that you take more pride in or more happiness in than anything else you've done? Are there are there moments where you look back and go, "Wow, I'm a lucky guy." Cuz that's how I feel. I feel I was lucky to work for Pro Wrestling Illustrated. What is your golden moment or any any number of them? Well, you're throwing me an interesting question here and and I will remind anybody that's going to be listening to this that uh, Bob and I have not rehearsed anything here. So. No, no, not at all. No. Here's the deal, and I'm, I'm going to kind of take you in a little weird direction. Um, and I'm not going to go into it very deeply because I, I do have a podcast out there where I kind of shared a lot of stuff about my childhood. And for the purpose of our podcast here, my childhood sucked. It was lousy. I didn't have a family. I didn't have a settled, steady home, nothing. And I turned to wrestling as a, as a young kid. 
my my wrestling involvement at, as a young kid was getting to the local newsstand when the wrestling review or wrestling monthly or wrestling world or ring wrestling or the wrestler inside wrestling, pro wrestling <laughs> whatever it was and came out and i would buy them and uh getting to the matches here and there as a kid with my dad when he would take me or have time to take me he hated wrestling so God love him when he did. I appreciate it. But the bottom line was this, and this will answer your question. If I had one accomplishment, my uh, my career, I was in banking for 30 years. And uh, I loved my job. I was a trainer. I was a lender, a manager. Um, I'd go back and do it again if I could. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. But... The most successful thing that I've ever done is that I've got involved with wrestling, and it's always been there for me when my life has been upside down, when I've had a hard time in life. As a kid, as a teenager, I had a rough time. I shouldn't, I shouldn't even be alive because I, I could have done, I could have went down the wrong road. And wrestling mm-hmm. was my drug. I, I say that seriously. Wrestling was my drug. And I, w- I was alone with it because a lot of my friends didn't like wrestling. And so... When I think back, and even to this very moment, um, there is a, there, I've been retired, it seems like yesterday, but I've been retired 15 years. Mm-hmm. And honest, hand on a Bible, there's not one day that has went by that I have not worked something around wrestling every single day. So it, to me, is who I am. And I had mentioned to you earlier, I do have a room in my house <clears throat> that is a, a wrestling Family calls it a museum. (laughs) It's got all my files, all my bios, all my wrestlers, all my results, all my programs, ceiling to floor, wall to wall, framed photos, posters. I've got memorabilia things that I've collected. I'm the only one that ever goes in there. Mm -hmm. It's very selective. I don't bring the world in there. It's my world. I mean, unless I have a serious wrestling fan, nobody sees it. I've got family members that have never been in there. So my world is private in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, my accomplishments, it's that I've made it through life with wrestling as a gift. And that's what I call it, a blessing. That it has always been there for me when life is stamped on me, stomped on me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but. I stayed away from drugs and alcohol and whatever else wrong in life, swaying, you know, going down the wrong path. <clears throat> um, I was blessed with a with a good wife for the we got 50 years coming up together. Nice. 50 years in January, we're gonna be married. And she's a princess, and she has tolerated this wacky wild world of professional <laughs> wrestling. <clears throat> and uh so that's what it is. So you ask me my accomplishments, the fact that I've had the honor to be around it, and and even more so, knowing the wrestlers that I have and the people in the business, when when they called me their friend, I take a big breath. You know, I mean, when Nick Bockwinkle tells mm-hmm. me I was his friend, and, and he calls me, and he comes to my house, and we talk, or, you know, The Destroyer. One of my favorites, absolutely one of my favorites. Uh, when he's he visits, and and he passed away now a few years ago, but uh, I shed real tears, real tears came down my cheeks when these guys passed because they were more my family than my family. And that's what pro wrestling has done. So to me, I I tell so this is what I tell young kids today. You know, we're living in a world, and I don't mean to get on any soapbox here. But the world is so different than what it was when, when I'll put you and me in this together, when we were kids. It's a lot more dangerous. It's a lot more, uh, the social media has turned the world upside down. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot more violence. Uh, we got killings every day in the cities and, and all the voices that are out there that can lead people down the wrong tracks. My advice to anyone out there is find a hobby. Find something that's just you and latch onto it. And whether it be collecting stamps or comic books or a wrestling fan or cars, whatever it is, that's just you. And that hobby, let it sustain you. And when life is tough. And aside from that, 
I have I have a very strong uh, religious belief, but we're not going to we don't need to go there. But that's what it is. Um, when life has been tough, wrestling has been my thing, and I've been allowed to write books, contribute. I think I've contributed uh, to <clears throat> maybe close to a hundred books now. It might wow. be, more. you know, and we're talking we're talking books that are on wrestlers, the Bruiser book, and and so many books, plus the ones that I've done, and uh, the fact that I've been around the wrestlers and that they trusted me. You know, back when kayfabe was in full vogue. Um, uh, Red Bastine, I know you've heard that name. I saw Red Bastine. Are you kidding me? Red, Red Bastine, you know, right behind me, you see, you can see my, I got a couch over here. Red Bastine sat on this couch, <laughs> watched, watched, uh, wrestling with me here mm -hmm. years ago. But Red Bastine was the very first wrestler when I was 17 years old, took me into the locker room with him. Just, just said, come on, just come on in with me. And and this was what I learned. Now, this was back in 1969, the summer of 69. And I the door opened, and first thing I noticed was that, amazingly, the bad guys and the good guys were all in the same room. The other thing that I noticed was as soon as they saw me with red, the proverbial, you could hear a pin drop, it got silent. Mm -hmm. Kayfabe was in place. And True. Red, Red said, he says, never mind, the boy's fine. Boy's good. And then their banter started up and they were talking. But I was in there with Red Bastine. <clears throat> and I had the same opportunities with, uh, I always call him Doc, but it was Dick Byer. He was Dr. X. Right. Always called him Doc. And uh, he was the same thing. You know, you just come on in with me. And, you know, if you're fine. <laughs> they trusted me and they knew I wasn't going to go out and spill the storyline or the results to the card that night because I never broke kayfabe. And that was that was a that was heartfelt. That's something that not every fan gets. And it's not right. easy to get. Yeah, no, it's not. The wrestlers, Even, yeah. the wrestlers went out of their way to avoid fans for that reason. Not that they were unfriendly, mm -hmm. but they weren't going to get up close and personal with you. That was the rule back then. And, and and they wouldn't, you know, they couldn't do it. And so I had the chance um, a few times where I actually had the opportunity to put a cart, couple wrestling cards together. So I guess I was the promoter per se mm -hmm. at my local gymnasium spot shows and, and go to the wrestling club and work with them and get the wrestlers to appear there. And that's how I met Dr. X the first time he and I collaborated on, on a card. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I've had I've, just the opportunities that, you know, the kids today, like I say, they, they had a different product and, and, and they're going out and, they're, and it's fine. They have to go to fan fests and things to meet their favorite wrestlers and get a picture with them and pay for an autograph. And I never had to do that. And I, I'm thankful for that. If I wanted an autograph from anybody, I'd just say, you know, would you sign my photo for me? And sure. And they put, you know, they put an inscription on there and, um, so, yeah, if you ask me what's my accomplishment, it's the other accomplishment that comes out of it is that I, uh, I, uh, like I said, I've been married 50 years. I've had the goal of always to be the best husband I could be, be the best dad I could be. I had parents that were non existent in my family. I wouldn't, they weren't, they didn't subscribe to the how to be a good parent program. And so um, the fact that I just wanted to be a good dad, be there for my girls, be a good grandpa. There you go. Well, and if I, I can... die right now, if I drop dead right now, mm -hmm. I've been a success. Don't don't do that now. No, no, no. I, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, people... I'll, get, I'll get a lot of downloads, but no, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to say I did the last podcast yeah. <laughs> with this clown. This yeah. is it, folks. <laughs> right. Hey, listen, I let me blow a little smoke at you. Yeah. I, there's three people that's coming to mind. I know there's more than this, but I just want to compliment you. You, Bill After, Tom Burke, didn't just work wrestling. You had wrestling lives. You know what I'm saying? You didn't do it. It wasn't just a job you had. Your lives revolved around, and to this day, it's still the same. And I think that's to all of our benefits that we have the luxury and pleasure of reading your words 
discovering your work, listening to your voice. I mean, I just want to thank you for doing what you've done all these years. And like I said, this book's been in my collection for so long, and I forgot it was you that wrote it. <laughs> I hate to say it. But, well, uh, but um, you know, I just want to say thanks. As a fan who was lucky enough to fall into the wrestling business, you, you people like you are the people that entertain me and inform me, and I couldn't ask for more than that. I could I I don't know what to say. You're just very kind. You know, <laughs> um, one of the things that I've learned in life, Bob, is and my wife and I talk about this all the time. Life is a is a big puzzle. Just you know, you you, you pick out any jigsaw puzzle. You know how frustrating it can be because you can't find certain pieces that fit. Oh, they just don't fit, or or you know, they're just well. That's what life is. Life is mm -hmm. a big puzzle. It is and. We, we go along and we do things, you know, we make plans, we, we go to school, we're going to do whatever we're going to do. But when you stop and think, when I look back at my career, everything that I've done up to this very moment, I'm sitting with you. A lot of it has happened just because I was in the right place at the right time and it worked. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school and I, I was a fan of wrestling, I wanted to be a writer. I took some journalism classes and I grew, I graduated from high school at a time when you didn't have to graduate and go off to a four-year college and get a degree. You could still graduate from high school and, you know, get a job and maybe stay at a company for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, that mm -hmm. was the old days. It is all right. My dad is, my dad was like that too. Absolutely. Right. And so was my dad. And, but the world is different today, but I took some journalism classes, just the idea I wanted to learn to write. I wanted to write for magazines. I started doing fan clubs. I started I started a fan club. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was involved with fan clubs. I wrote articles for fan clubs, columns, stories on wrestlers, whatever. Then I wanted to go into broadcasting. We had some radio stations here in the Twin Cities that, man, they knocked my socks off with the talent. And I wanted to be like one of them. I wanted to be a DJ. I wanted to be a... a, a, a rock and roll DJ. I went to school. I graduated from radio school back in the days when you had to get a degree to go on the radio, which by the way, you don't need to anymore. Right. Anybody can walk in and get on the radio. I mean, that's scary to me because we don't have talent anymore. Now, did I go into radio? You say they won't have talent. You know where the talent is? It's on the podcast. That's where they are. Well, that's probably true. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. It because, is true. Because you, you're not under a corporate blanket Right. And you, you can say what you're not. And you, you, the best, most successful podcasts are either freeform conversations or people who know a whole lot about something. Right. Right. Uh, genre, Absolutely. genre podcast. Right. Well, and when I look at the podcasts, I mean, holy cow, in the last decade, I, I think I'm up to, I, I got to be up close to 2,000 podcasts that I've done. Good gravy. Seriously. I look back and I go, my God, I can't believe it. I look at my calendar and, I'm I'm constantly doing one or two, it seems like a week. I, I'm not complaining. I love it. Yeah. Because I'm talking about something which absolutely I never need a script. I hear you. I get it. Listen, we're reaching the end of our uh, our hour here. Would you do me a favor and do a commercial for yourself? Where can people find you? Where would you like them to go to read you, to hear you? Anything else? The floor is yours. Well, first of all, if you're on the social media platform, I have a Facebook wrestling page, George Shire's Wrestling Time Machine. And you can join it. Just click join. Um, the only rule on the page is that we don't talk or post anything beyond 1990. It's old. So if you want to talk about something modern day, don't join the page unless you want to learn history. And if you go to the page, and I, don't, I think, Bob, you're on my page. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, there, you, you can scroll, 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 and there's history lessons and, and historical uh, memorabilia, et cetera, shared by myself and others. So George Shire's Wrestling Time Machine. Also, I am uh, one of the admins on the AWA American Wrestling Association, AWA American Wrestling Association wrestling page. You can join that one. That's all AWA. Then I'm on a million other pages, and i offer my two cents here and there. But if you're interested in my book, it is available through any of your major booksellers. They can order it for you if it's not on their shelves. Barnes & Noble has usually got them. If you live out of state, probably you got to have it ordered. Or 
best way, go to Amazon.com. You know, they got it. And uh, that's probably the cheapest, too. You can get it from them. And my uh, three AWA wrestling books are on Amazon as well. That record. Well, George, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to my listeners. If you don't own Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling from Vern Gagne to the Road Warriors, what are you waiting for? I'm really serious about this. There's a handful of wrestling books that I consider to be classics. This is one of them. And it's got amazing photos if you're into that. More history than I've ever seen crammed into this number of pages. It's astounding. Even if you're not an AWA junkie like I used to be, check this book out. If you want to learn more and more about wrestling history, learn about George Shire. This is a one of a kind gentleman. And I want to thank you profusely for being here. And I hope you come back again sometime soon. I have, you put me over completely. Uh, so many thanks. I appreciate that. And I, I am ready to talk old school wrestling anytime you want to, my friend. And again, I would say the same to you. Thank you. Because I, I did follow your stuff in the magazines and uh, anybody that wants to keep the old school alive, they're a best friend to me. So yes, I, you. this, this is the whole concept behind this show. I want to impart what it was like in a simpler time to just have fun with this stuff. You know, it, it wasn't so mock serious all the time. It was a wonderful hobby. And, uh, I missed that, but now I don't have to miss it. Cause I, I get to talk to people like you and Terry Sullivan and Bill after and, all the classic names in old school pro wrestling. So once again, hats off, man. It's a real pleasure for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. I appreciate it. I'll be back anytime you want me. Oh, you can count, you count on that. You're going to get a message from me sometime soon. All right. This is George Shire. This one of a kind. Check out his work right away. Well, I'm hoping you really enjoyed the conversation with George Shire. I know I did. Is he amazing or what? An incredible wrestling historian. What a guy. Hope to talk to him again really soon. It was really enjoyable for me, and I'm hoping it's every bit as enjoyable for you. As far as the intro to today's show, um, I'm sure you know who Mr. Brock was referring to or who he was supposed to be. I'm told I'm going to say about it. You have to be an old London publishing wrestling magazine fan to kind of get the joke there. But um, I have a feeling a lot of you did. I hope you like the way that came out. I'm kind of thrilled with it. I have more fun doing the opening segments of the show. <laughs> uh, it's hard to come up with concepts sometimes, but I think when we hit one, we hit it out of the park. I hope you get a few chuckles out of it. And uh, we're going to keep doing it because uh, I've recently got some really nice comments about Bob 20 minutes from now. So we're going to keep featuring him on the show. He's my boy. It's actually me about five minutes from now. I'm going to be screaming for soup in a deli. You wait and see. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's it for this show. I got to do my usual um, advertisements here. The Outdated Wrestling Hour fan club on outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. For a nominal fee, you can become part of the production of the show. Help us perpetuate into the future. Take part in Zoom-style meetings, win a prize while you're there, perhaps, and other fun stuff. The ability to talk to me anytime you choose to. Remember, it's outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. I mean, you'd be silly not to get involved, wouldn't you? I think it's important to somebody. (laughs) Well, anyway, also at that website, you can binge listen to every one of our podcasts are all there from one to whatever this 40 something whatever the heck this is listen to them all enjoy them all without the use of an app i know i i do have a, a coterie of listeners who don't use apps they really use a website so there it is outdated wrestling hour dot buzzsprout dot com hold on a sec that's our theme song performed by mr brian teal the guitarist extraordinaire oh and by the way the great jazz background for the opening sequence was performed by the remarkable Mr. Kevin McLeod. Find me on Facebook at Bob Smith. Go to the lead page if you can't figure out which Bob Smith it is. I'm the one singing with BB King for real. I'm on Twitter at Bob Smith NYC, but don't bother. I, I'm rarely there. Write to us at outdated wrestling at gmail.com. That's outdated wrestling at gmail.com. Say anything you like. Tell me you don't like my beard. Do whatever you want to do. It's all for you. Let us know what you want to hear. 
you know what? You have guest suggestions. Uh, let me know. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about the show. Good, bad, or indifferent. Write to us. I really don't mind. And I'll write back. Next time, we have Brad Drake, who is the president of the new, really revived WFIA. That's going to be a blast, too. Um, I'm really glad to see traditional pro wrestling or classic pro wrestling seem to be making a comeback these days in many different ways. Brad is uh, really working hard on this project, and uh, you should join. You should really join the WFIA. He's going to tell you how to do it. Um, we're going to really get into the nuts and bolts and nitty-gritty of why he revived it and a lot of other things, too. So my name is Bob Smith. I used to be a wrestling magazine editor and writer for the best wrestling magazines in the world, the ones published by London Publishing. And by the way, I want to thank Craig Peters. Craig and I got together for the first time in a long time in New York City recently. Craig, you're the best. I don't know what to say other than uh, we hope to have you back in the show soon. And uh, you're one of a kind, man. And it just, I, I really hope that the friendships I made at London will continue on for the rest of my life because I really do treasure those people. I really do. Bill and everybody else there. Bill Aptor, I should say. So that's it for now. My name's Bob Smith. Come back to more of the outdated wrestling hour if you'd be so very, very kind. And until then, take care of yourselves. And I wish nothing but peace and happiness to everybody involved in your life. <laughs>